All right, so let me give my little welcome here. So I'm Lisa, I'm manning the technical desk here for this meeting, and welcome to June's talk shop. And there we are. So here's our agenda for the day. Um, we're gonna turn this over to Lynn in a moment just to formally welcome us, although I think most of us have been here long enough to, to be welcomed <laughs> already. And Winifred Bird is going to be doing our interviews today. Thank you, Winnie. We're lucky to have her guiding us. Um, so we've got three people from, three, mostly translator, I think. We're gonna get the details on, on, on everyone today, but we have Brenda Hart and Susan, all from Northern Nagano. We'll do interviews for about 20 minutes each. We'll stop for a comfort break, probably 10 minutes, and then questions. Okay, thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar and not familiar faces. Um, and especially thank you to our three speakers, guests. Our next speaker is Hart Larrabee. We have Hart, is Hart out there? Oh. We can't. Okay, hi Hart. <laughs> So Hart is a Japanese to English translator based since 2002 in Nagano in the town of Obuse. Originally from New York State, Hart's connection with Japan goes back to summer language study at Middlebury College and then a junior year abroad spent at Doshisha University in Kyoto. After earning a BA in Japanese in 1989, he apprenticed with a Japanese paper artist in Kyoto interpreted for comic actor Issei Ogata on overseas tours and interpreted for a Nagasaki gardener rebuilding a Japanese garden in the United States, among other things. Um, he went on to obtain master's degrees in communications and business administration and returned to Japan to work in Olympic and International Games Administration between 1995 and 2009. And since 2010, he has been a full-time translator uh, freelance, I believe, full-time freelance translator, with projects spanning poetry, short stories, children's books, nonfiction books on architecture, design, and photography, marketing material, and more. He is married to an acupuncturist and has three children, the oldest of whom is currently in high school. And Hart has been an engaged member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, the Japan Association of Translators, and SWET for many years. You can read his article on joining a literary translation workshop sponsored by the British Center for Literary Translation in 2012 at the uh, SWET website. So Hart, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Um, let's start with the same question I asked Brenda. And I believe Obuse was one of the sites for the 1998 Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics, which you were involved in. Was that what got you hooked on Nagano? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Obuse was not uh, a, a, a site of any competition for the 1998 Games. Um, but at, I was working since late 1995 uh, at the organizing committee for the Olympic Winter Games in Nagano. And uh, I had been to Nagano previously with a friend a couple years before. We'd gone to see Kurobe Dam and gone to see Zenkoji. And so I I knew of Nagano before the Olympics, um, but stumbled into this job with the organizing committee. Uh, and in the course of that job, my, my responsibilities were to be a liaison between the organizing committee and the, um, the Olympic teams from Western Europe. Uh, and one of, my, one of my countries was Great Britain. And the, 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 the delegate from Great Britain had run into someone on the Shinkansen who lived in Obuse, an American who lived in Obuse, and had retained that person to be an assistant in preparing their on the ground, you know, getting things ready on the ground for them. So through this Great Britain connection and this woman that lived in Obuse and worked for a, a brewery here, um, because of my position with liaising for the team, I went, to, I was in and out of Obuse a couple of times and thought, what a strange little town. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it's a very physically compact. Um, it's small, it's only about 10,000 people. Um, but this woman's, the president of this woman's company has a, had a very elevated design sense, was clearly spending a lot of money on, uh, on things he didn't need to spend money on in his business, on the way his store looked, on logos, on signage, 
And it was just a very strange, uh, unexpected, uh, my first impression of Obese was through this brewery and it was sort of unexpected. So um, much later, after the Olympics were over uh, and a couple years after that, I decided to get married to a woman who I had met through the Olympics, who was from Nagano, but the Yamanouchi area, a little further up, a little further north, um, near the Shigakogan area, where, where this events were held. And when we got married, we decided, okay, where are we gonna live? Uh, we could live in Nagano City, must have worked, or we could live in Yamanouchi, where her parents still were, but we didn't really wanna live right you know, next door to her parents. And I didn't really want to live in Nagano City. And Obese was physically kind of a nice, uh, you know, 20 minutes from Nagano City, 20 minutes from her parents. And my wife had a, uh, a schoolmate whose father ran a small real estate business here in Obese. And as we were thinking about where to live, she called her friend and said, hey, does your dad have anything on you know, any listings? And he just happened to have a very small little house uh, that we could afford and that we could we could live in. So that's how we got started. Um, I found trying to find a place to rent even even in 2002 uh, was really tough with a cat and with a foreigner. Um, because a lot of people, either one of those things, you're just you're not you're you're not on the list anymore. Suddenly suddenly the listing disappears. So we made that work, um, and so we sort of, you know we settled here. Uh huh. I don't know Great. if that, and, that doesn't answer the question. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. Um, right, it gets a bit off the beat of a bit off the beaten track, uh, but it sounds like a great place. So, in 2010, I guess you ended um, your 15 years of Olympic and Games-related work to be, uh, to become a full-time translator. Um, so, can you tell us a bit about what inspired you to make that leap and how you achieved it? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Brenda talked about being really career oriented, um, and I'm not. I, you know, I, I, I'm just not. Um, so I have mostly stumbled from one thing to the other um, without a lot of long term. You know, this is my long term goal, and I'm going to push for it. And I'm going to make it happen. I just kind of stumble from one thing to the other as as things come up and as things seem interesting. Um, so I was translating, uh, you know. I don't, professionally, I don't know, I was translating for money, translating for clients back as far as 95, um, uh, at least as far as 95. Uh, and I was translating on the side all the time I was doing Olympic work. Um, one of the things about Olympic work is that it's, it's, it's sort of seasonal. You know, I mean, the, the Nagano Olympics, I was there for two and a half years. And then I worked for the Japanese Olympic Committee for two years. And then I worked for the Salt Lake Organizing Committee for close to two years. And that was sort of from one thing to the other without a lot of, without too much empty space between. Um, but from 2002 to 2008 or 2010, it was spotty. I do six months with an international, I don't know, writing work for uh, a world athletics championship in Osaka. I did six months with the Special Olympics when they were held in Nagano. I did, there was something else I did where I was doing a lot of flying in and out, which was fun. Um, and then the last big thing was the, the 2016 um, uh, bid, Tokyo's unsuccessful 2016 bid. So I was with them for about nine months up until, uh, up until they got voted out in uh, September 2016. And then since then, I just haven't, it's not that I made any big decision. It's just that uh, as my children got older, um, it's been harder and harder to, to say, okay, well, I'll just go I'll, for, the, for, the, for the Tokyo 2016 bid, I was commuting. So I was spending three days in Tokyo and then a couple of days at home. And then I'd spend three weeks on some trip and then I'd be back home. Mm -hmm. And my second child was like two and my third was just born and my wife was going crazy. And it, it wasn't, it clearly wasn't sustainable as, as my children were growing older mm -hmm. to keep prioritizing my own, what I'd really like to do. So it wasn't so much a decision of, hey, I really want to, now I can, now I can, mm -hmm. I can go freelance. It was just, okay, 
I'm not going to chase Olympic work anymore. It's, they're not chasing me and I'm not going to chase it. And I'm going to focus on the things that I can do where I am. Yeah. So um, one of the interesting projects you've worked on was a book that I believe was published in 2016. Uh, and it was a book of your translations of classic haiku poems by Matsu Obasho, Yosa Busan, Kobayashi Isa, and Masa Okashiki. Mm -hmm. So it's some of the most famous writers and poets in Japan. Can you tell us how that project came about? Uh, sure. Um, you know, like, again, like most other things, I, I, I'm a terrible salesperson and I'm not career oriented. So I, I, not, I have never gotten a job when I've, through sending applications or through you know, cold calling people. It just, it's never worked for me. Um, but I've, the things that I've done that have been interesting or that have been rewarding, have, I'd say all come through connections, come through people I've worked for, someone recommends me to a friend, the friend calls me. In this particular case, one of the participants in, the, uh, in that 2000, what was it, 2011, 2012 workshop in Great Britain, mm -hmm. uh, who I was friendly with, I'm one of my co-students on the trip, um, someone called him, a British co publisher called him and said, hey, we need someone to translate a bunch of haiku. Could you do it? And he was busy. He thought, I can't do it. Maybe Hart's interested. Um, the publisher, to my mind, really didn't know what they wanted. Um, they, they gave me a, 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 basically they had called a list of, of haiku poems from something that was out of copyright. Uh, and they had this long list and they had, it was a mix, there was no thematic coherence, it was just a mess. And I thought, I don't want to do this, this is crazy. So if I said, if I'm going to do it, here's what I propose. And I proposed doing selections from the big four. Um, uh, so I chose the poets and then chose the poems and then did the translations. Um, and my ulterior motive was that all those poets have been translated before. Um, and often very poorly, um, sometimes very well. But there's enough, you know, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a poet myself. I, I don't write my own poems. Um, and, I, and I'm not a, uh, I'm not a haiku expert. I mean, the last, before this project came, I hadn't done anything with haiku since probably grade school. You know, I mean, it's, wow. it, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't know anything about haiku beyond the standard stuff you pick up just living in the world. But it was an interesting project. And so I said, okay, sure. So that was, um, so, you know, I read a lot of uh, existing English translations uh, of many poems I was already familiar with, tried to select 22 from each of the big four that were where I felt the English translations were inadequate, where there wasn't any, there were some that was like, there's nothing I can do to improve this. Someone's already nailed this one. There's nothing I can do to improve it. So we're going to set that aside, even though it's a great poem. There's, there's no point in just you know, adding a the or making some minor cosmetic change just to claim it's mine. It's, it's been done. But there were enough that have been done poorly um, or that have been done in ways that didn't highlight certain things that could be highlighted that I thought there was room to play. So that was, uh, that was how that came out. I mean, it's uh, just serendipity. Interesting. That's so, a really one, interesting one approach. Project, um, the one thing about that project that was uh, I think unusual maybe is uh, they wanted to do an, originally they wanted to do an illustrated version. Mm -hmm. And I said, and they sent some really horrible illustrations. <laughs> and I, and I said, this is just, let's, let's just do it straight text. We'll do, we'll do the, the English, we'll do the, the, the Romaji transliteration, we'll do the English translation and we'll do the Japanese source. No explanation beyond a short introduction that I wrote and no illustrations. So it's just the reader and the poem. And then readers that know a little Japanese uh, can try to double check my translation, see what they, you know, against the original, see where I've made mistakes or see where they think I've made mistakes or where they might be something. It's more of a book. Because um, one of the experiences I've had when I read haiku or if I've, when I want to research them, is that there's this often this long introductory paragraph that tells you what to think about the poem, and then they present the poem, and everybody says, ah, yes. And so you know, you're not thinking, you're just receiving. So I thought this was, a, I was glad the publisher um, 
accepted this approach, which I think makes the book maybe of interest to in an educational context where you can you can put the thing out there without the internet and just talk about it. And all, everything's on the page that you need, um, at least in the language level, to sort of think about it. And then you can go to the internet and do your research and, and double check what your inter whether your interpretation fits what others have interpreted. Unfortunately, they decided to go out and they're gonna publish an, an illustrated version this month, next month, sometime this fall. And the illustrations are mostly dreadful. Um, they sent them to me to review and I, I, I tried to point out a few that were just really horrible and they've made some changes, but it's, it's gonna come out. We stripped me, I agreed that we'd take out eight or 10 poems, um, but some of the illustrations are just really, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's such an interesting approach. Um, and, uh, you know, as you mentioned there, these are all poems that have been translated before and I'm sure are quite well known. Um, what do you think different, uh, differentiate, differentiates your translations? Is there kind of like a thoroughgoing stylistic approach you took or was it kind of each poem you approached on its own? Um, yeah, well, um, like I said, I was sort of learning a little bit, I mean, as I was, as I was doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a poet and I'm not a haiku expert. So what I am or what am I? What's the approach I bring to it? I said, okay, I'm gonna take a translator's approach. And, and my general approach in translating is to try not to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do an adapt, adaptation. I'm trying to make a balance between what, what the te what's in the text, the letter, and then what's in, what's in the whole, in the, in the, the spirit. I mean, I, want, I don't use it very much, but my business, the, the name for my business is Letter and Spirit Translations. It, it, and it's what I, what I try to do is balance the letter of the text, the letter of what the text says with the spirit. And if you fall too, on too much of one side or the other, then I think you've done a disservice, usually. So with the haiku, one of the things I don't like about a lot of the, the existing translations is that they add a lot. They add a ton of stuff that just isn't in the source. And part of that is because a lot of the earlier early translators, I think, tried to mimic the 757, the syllable structure, Japanese mm -hmm. English. And to do that, just because of the way the languages work, you almost inevitably have to add something. I mean, you just, you just can't stretch the words that are in the Japanese into the 757 syllables in English without throwing something extra in. Um, and I think often there's a lot of, um, uh, what, a lot of, uh, maybe because influence of the early translators perhaps, but there's a lot of mystification, right? There's a lot of, oh, it's haiku, so it has to be really Buddhist, and it has to be really Zen, and it has to be really calming. It has to be like a warm cup of tea and soothing. And I, I, I just don't think that the, that the reality of Japanese haiku, as I've understood it, supports that. I think it can be much more playful and surprising. And um, uh, yeah. so yeah. There's, there's no reason to, over, to oversell a, um, a particular approach unless it's supported by the poem. And I just think usually it's not. So my, I try to be stripped down, mm -hmm. uh, more, more, minimal, more minimalist. Um, but there's a lot of, if you look at the book, there's a lot of failures where I've, I've you know, I, I look back and I'm like, oh, I've, I haven't really, I haven't really kept the cutting word. I haven't really kept the two-part structure that a haiku is typically supposed to have. So there's lots of things I would do again, but that's one of the nice things about haiku is that there's sort of so little to work with, and yet it's also open-ended, um, yeah. but there's lots and lots of ways to do it dreadfully, um, and lots and lots of ways to do it pretty good. So it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun um, genre, a fun, a fun topic. Yeah. Um, well, I think we only have a few more minutes with you, Hart, but I did want to touch on something um, that you mentioned in, in our correspondence yeah. before the event, which I thought was interesting. Um, you mentioned that you often spend a lot of time fact checking the writing that you translate. Now, this may not go for the haiku project, but for other uh, book projects, maybe your nonfiction books mm -hmm. or essays. Um, you said you oftentimes find a lot of, um, for example, 
misquoted uh, quotes, uh, the quotes that don't exist that have been just turned into quotes out of thin air, kind of. Um, <laughs> which I, I find too that that line between translating and editing can often become very blurred. Um, so I'm curious how far you think uh, we as translators should go into this type of work and correction. Um, and maybe if you just, could just give us an example of, of where that came up and how you handled it. Mm -hmm. Uh, how far should we go? Uh, I don't know. It's a matter of personal preference and what the client really wants. Uh, in the examples that I think we mentioned in email were sort of book length, sort of scholarly projects. Well, one more recently was a sort of scholar. It's a it's a photo essay, but it's written by someone that's the the the, uh, the criticism that I'm translating is trying to be sort of scholarly with lots of quotes and 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 things. Um, so part of it is if you've got a client who just doesn't, who doesn't want to address issues with the source and just wants you to translate what is on the page, well, that's fine. Um, but if, if the client doesn't want to, you shouldn't waste any time tracking that down. Um, but typically the clients I've had have been uh, happy to have errors of fact uh, corrected because it raises the quality of the product. Um, it, it makes it more, it makes it more, uh, uh, what? Uh, more attractive to the people that, that understand. Um, the other thing is, I, I have a really tough time translating stuff I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just me. But so, yeah. in order yeah. to, a lot of times, in order to understand what, and often, you know, often the hardest parts to translate are the parts that are in between the lines. Uh, something is said, and then what's implied by that. And so, when you translate, you need to leave you need to leave whatever was implied by the text open. Otherwise, you, you, you've missed something. Um, I don't know, examples. Um, the, the one example that comes to mind is I was, I've been trans, in this recent project, I've been translating, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's this critical essay about uh, uh, Isamu Noguchi design park in Sapporo. And it makes all these references to Sai Hoji, this temple in Kyoto. And a lot of those references are just, are just plain wrong. I mean, it's, it talks about walking up this pathway and entering, going to this garden, and then turning back and looking at the pond. Well, if you, if you, you can't, there's too many trees between that spot and the pond, you can't look back and see the pond. It's physically impossible. Um, uh, so, you know, he, talk, he, had a, he had a river running the wrong direction along the south side of the, of the temple. So mm -hmm. none of these are hugely important. Um, but they undermine his argument if you leave them in there. Anybody who's been to Sai Hoji is going to say, no, you can't. So we strip those out. And he's, he's made the adjustments. Um, the bigger problem with hit this particular article was he was drawing a lot of quotes from a biography of Noguchi that was written by a Japanese woman. Very thoroughly researched, but it's filled with quotes. Well, it's filled with statements, Noguchi's statements that are treated as quotes. Um, but they're, they're, they don't exist in the record. Um, she's cherry picked bits and pieces of interviews and put them together. That fits her story, fits her narrative, but it's nothing Noguchi ever said. Um, uh, yeah. This author is then qu quoting those as something Noguchi stated. And it's this very, you know, like, this is the source of my artistic inspiration kind of stuff. But he right. never did, <laughs> and it's it, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't read like something Noguchi said. So I've had to go back and go to the Noguchi archives and track those things down and send. This took I mean I lost a week. It was horrible. Um, wow. Wow. So part of that is just I can't translate what it says unless I understand it. And to understand it, I try to go to the source. Um, the interesting thing about that particular project is the woman's husband translated the English version, and he's a, he's, a, he's an academic at Stanford, and he produced he gave proper sourcing for all of the things he left in the book, but he left out all the problematic passages. <laughs> right, right. Well, that, the, this is very interesting, and maybe we can continue to talk about it a little more in the Q&A. We have to go on, so we'll have time to, to hear from Susan, but um, I, I, maybe, yeah, maybe we can, can um, circle back to this. So thank you. Um, thank you, Hart. That was really interesting.